But let's go ahead and start, um, and let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word and for your revelation to us. We confess that we would be lost and just totally ignorant without your word. We thank you for this confession of faith, for the faithfulness of the man who worked on it years ago. We pray as we study it this morning that you would help us to understand your word better, uh, clearer, and that we would see the Lord Jesus. Uh, please help me as I speak to be clear, and we just thank you for your grace. We ask that in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we have been, in case this is new to you or uh, whatever, this is chapter 4 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, and we have been, I guess, I don't know what week we're on, because we've spent more than one week on some of the chapters. Um, this week is actually a very short chapter. I'm very thankful for that. Um, however, as I looked through it, I found that it touches on so many different topics and issues that you could really probably talk for weeks on this chapter, especially in light of our current culture and issues that face the church today. Um, and that's why at the very beginning I asked the question, if the Westminster D Divines were to meet today to write the Westminster Confession, perhaps this chapter would be quite a bit longer, um, just because there are new issues that they were not dealing with in the 1600s that are in the forefront today. And I would say, obviously, the two main ones would be science, and especially by that I mean neo-Darwinism and atheistic Darwinism, and uh, the LGBT, et cetera, um, positions and the mass confusion on sexuality in our day. Um, Genesis 1 and 2 directly address both of those issues and have been a battlefield, for lack of a better word, for really especially in the Darwinism uh, question for a couple hundred years here. So um, we're uh, dealing with things that perhaps they didn't need to deal with. However, on the other hand, <laughs> there's always another hand, right? Uh, I remember reading once that a rabbi said, if you didn't know, and I can't remember the number, it was big, 60 different interpretations of a passage, you didn't know it at all. Um, on the other hand, this, uh, this passage or this chapter has the biblical presentation of creation and stands, and it still addresses these two issues. And in a lot of ways, we don't need any more sentences or points under here. Um, and I think that's the value of the Westminster Confession is that they spent so much time trying to formulate scriptural truth that scriptural truth is timeless. It, it will always be relevant, it will always address issues um, in our culture, and we just have to clearly look at what it is saying. There is a logical order in the presentation of the chapters in the Westminster Confession. Having been an English teacher, I like to see things in stories, and uh, this used to be a point of contention with uh, one of my colleagues. He and I were both Bible department, we were the Bible department, and he was death on the word story. He hated to refer to Bible events and records and accounts were the words he would use as stories because the minute you said the word Bible story, to him it implied myth, fiction, um, whatever. And as an English teacher, I sat there going, but you're missing the literary purpose of a story not to demean the truth of it or the historicity of it, but that there's a story form which makes it easier to remember. It also heightens a point to the events, and it's not like reading a police record. You know, at 0950, so-and-so broke the speed limit. Well, so what? Okay, you need to have it in the context 
of a story or a plot to get somewhere. What's the point of that? And in many ways, the point of the Bible is Jesus. Um, it's primarily written to tell us redemptive historical reality, how we can know God, how we can find forgiveness, salvation, how we can live before him. Those are some of the main issues. And in a sense, there is a Bible story. And here in chapter 4, it's kind of like it's lights, camera, action, if I could say it that way. The first three chapters, in a sense, are the background. We base our belief on Scripture, who is God, the Trinity primarily, and then the decrees of God. All of that is not to say that's not important and significant and primary, but from a story position, that's like what happens off camera, okay? Creation is the start of our world's story, okay? And so when we get to, and I find it fascinating, that that's how scripture begins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Start the story, okay? Um, and so that's what we really kind of have here. And the Westminster Divines had two points, and it dawned on me this morning. It's, remember I had a person tell me, you're preparing to speak, clear up until you walk up there to, to say it. And um, this morning it dawned on me that these two points are Genesis chapter 1 and then Genesis chapter 2. The first point is the creation of the universe. That's what primarily the divines are talking about. Point two, creation of man, okay? Genesis 2. And so they're really following the biblical order, and I think this is where the Westminster Confession of Faith kind of drips scripture, if we can say it that way. And I think that should really give us some confidence, not to trust it blindly, but that it is a faithful representation of what the scripture says. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be aware, we shouldn't be critical even of it at, in places, but because it is a man-made document, but at the same time, to really appreciate the work and effort that was put into uh, forming it. So what I have done here is the first point is really what is the purpose of creation, primarily to glorify God, that's really the main point of that first um, section, and then the next one is about humanity, that we are a special creation, what we are endowed with, the image of God, and the responsibility. And I would say really what it's getting at, it doesn't use the language here, but it has all the elements of the covenant of works. Um, you see that uh, very clearly in the last sentence of the, the section. So what I thought we would do this morning is just go through and I'll go through the important phrases, uh, make a few comments on this, and then kind of summarize, simply because we have less than a half an hour to go through all of this, and that's really quite a bit of material. So, first of all, let's read number one. It pleased God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, for the manifestation of the glory of his eternal power, wisdom, and goodness, in the beginning to create or make of nothing the world and all things therein, whether visible or invisible, in the space of six days, and all very good. Okay, this is obviously the first chapter of Genesis, the six days of creation, ending in everything being very good. Um, notice that it starts out, it pleased God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have Trinitarian creation. We could go through the Bible. You can think of passages like John chapter 1, where the Son, nothing was made except through the Word. Christ is uh, very involved. You have uh, Genesis chapter 1, the Spirit was hovering or brooding over the darkness um, at creation. Obviously, the Father is the one who is saying, let there be uh, and all three members of the Trinity are actively involved in creation. But notice that it uses the word pleased there. I think in light of scientism today, which is really kind of a religion, um, 
the, one of the main tenets of Darwinism is that there is no purpose or intentionality or intelligence in the evolution of the world. It's all just random over time. And here, our confession, what the scriptures would teach, is that God purposed, planned, pleased to create the universe that it was something that he desired to do. He wasn't forced to. He didn't just wake up one day and say, you know, I'm kind of bored this week. Maybe I'll make a world, okay? Or something like that. That's not how it, how it plays out. God was pleased to create the universe. And in light of the previous chapter, we know that this even includes the future death and resurrection of Christ, and that all of this is part of God's good and perfect will. And so there's nothing random here. There's nothing arbitrary. Creation is totally planned and good, and that flies in the face of everything we hear in coming from atheistic science today, okay? And so I think this is kind of good news for us as the science world keeps panicking and threatening all kinds of catastrophes. We can see the world as God created it. It is his world, and it is a good world. He did it for the manifestation of the glory of his eternal power, wisdom, and goodness. Again, one of the tendencies of our modern church is to become very believer-centered and that everything is about us and that God almost exists as our bellhop or servant and that we just pray to him to get more stuff or, you know, get out of a jam or, or whatever it is. But what the scriptures would indicate and what the confession is pointing to here is that the point of the creation is God's glory, not ours. Okay, Yes, the creation is for us. In a sense, it's like God has made a, an aquarium and dropped us into this nice place to swim around, but it's for his glory. It's not for ours. And so, again, the focus is always on God and his purposes. Now, the three um, attributes or qualities that are expressed here, his power, his wisdom, and his goodness, really is kind of a reflection of Romans 1.20 or the verses right in that area where it talks about how ever since the creation of the world, his invisible power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through the things that are made. And so you have that scripture kind of in behind here. Um, notice that these main attributes would be seen in the size an enormity of the creation. Think about how many horsepower it would take to make this world, okay? Or how much whatever, it's gigantic. And so God's power is huge. His wisdom would underscore the complexity. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Expelled by Ben Stein, he goes on in great depth to look at microbiology and all the stuff that is in the cell, and it's like, whoa, this is a complex world. We don't live in a random, nonsense type of world. It's very organized, it's very intelligent, not in and of itself, but the design, it smacks of intelligence everywhere. And then his goodness, okay? Even though we even live in a sinful world and we see all kinds of evil and catastrophes around us, there's still a goodness to our world, okay? You, you look at how the, the animal life and the whole ecosystem is balanced and how everything kind of, in a sense, helps and feeds each other and it works together, and you go, wow, this is an amazing creation, even though it's under the curse of sin. Can you imagine what it will be like when there's no sin? Um, I, I think we make the mistake, this is one of the, the biggest errors I think that 
um, the modern church has fallen into because of the influence of Darwinism is to accept a fallen world as the norm and to project backwards and try to somehow figure out how this world remains this world but somehow was back then. No, it's a quantitative change. It's not something that's just evolutionary. When the fall happened, it had dramatic consequences on our culture and to, to take our culture as it is now or our world, our biology, and just backtrack it seems to me to be flawed. That's not good thinking, okay? We should start with the creation. It was very good. And so this is really what the confession is getting at, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the purpose, the intelligence, the wisdom, the power, all these things that are exhibited in the creation obviously speak directly against the voices in science and in other places that would, would contradict this um, and give us really no hope. I, I think that we live in such an ordered world with a divine God who is so magnificent, creating and caring for that is, should be very comforting. Um, that should be beyond anything that we can imagine. The next line here is that he did it in the beginning, and again, I would point out just, even though the divines were not aware of Darwinism, notice this is not an evolution. This is start, okay? In a sense, God hit the start button, and here we are, okay? There is no billions of years of progress here, okay? To create or make of nothing the world. The Latin phrase here is ex nihilo ad nihilum, out of nothing into nothing. I once had a teacher explain it, that if you can imagine a chalkboard and you wrote a big zero on there, that would not be what the Bible means by ex nihilo. You would have to erase the zero and then destroy the blackboard and the chalk and you to have ex nihilo ad nihilo, okay, to out of nothing into nothing. There is absolutely nothing except God at the creation of the world. There is no pre-existing matter. There's no eternal matter. There's no anything except God's word. He speaks and it is, okay? Let there be light and boom, there is light, okay? Um, all things therein, visible and invisible. I was actually, I learned something this when I went through this. I never really thought of it this way. When I think of creation, I've always thought birds, trees, animals, and all the rest of it. But it's talking here about the angelic realms, the whole spiritual hosts that exist, uh, that he created all things, visible six days of creation, and invisible. Um, the Apostle Paul talks a lot about powers and authorities, um, the different spiritual realities that exist. Um, personally, I don't know if I totally understand all of that, um, but uh, there's a famous, there's a story I always loved as a kid, and I still love it. Um, it's when, and I'll probably get it confused here, I think it's Elijah, but it might have been Elisha. I always get the two of them mixed up. Um, where there's the enemy armies are besieging the town, and God opens the eyes, and he sees the hosts of the Lord. Well, the word there in Hebrew is a word for armies, and literally what he's seeing is massive bodies of angelic troops, if I could say it that way. Um, and that the battle is the Lord's. And when the eyes were opened to see the reality, it was like, oh, we don't have to worry about this king with his army standing here. Um, that's a whole realm. And I think, you know, I grew up in school in the 60s and 70s, and 
um, really the empirical scientific viewpoint was what you grew up with and all of the ideas of the supernatural and all this were kind of like, eh, you know, only ninnies believe that kind of stuff. Um, and I thought, you know, the, the scriptures indicate that this is re real, this is reality. And notice that all things therein, whether visible or invisible, God is the creator, sustainer of all of those realities. And I think it's even beyond what we can understand. Um, this week at uh, the men's Bible study going through Revelation, there's a section where it talks about the seven thunders, which were seven more judgments, and John is commanded, do not write those down. And one of the points of that is that we don't even know all of the judgments that are coming or the future. It's really, we're very limited. But God, it's only what God has revealed to us. But I started thinking about thunders. That's different than a bowl or a, what are the other ones, a seal or a trumpet. It's a thunder. And I started wondering, and this would be pure supposition, um, whether it's more th judgments almost in an angelic realm. Um, who knows? Uh, the point of the text, obviously, is that we don't know, and we were prevented from understanding that. Um, and again, it's to put us in our place that God is God, and he has, holds the future in his hands. But this visible and invisible is quite a um, reality. The last one, or the next one, is in the space of six days. Um, apparently, the divines had some discussion here. Uh, I think there's a book you can get which um, catalogs the, the debates and what was said, kind of like a di daily diary. And I haven't consulted that. But in what I did read, they, there was a group within the divines that wanted to add 24-hour days to this, is what they wanted to say. And apparently they lost traction here uh, because it didn't make it into the confession. Um, and I know there's been a lot of debate over what are the six days and all the rest of it. Um, I've been reading and studying the Bible for 60 years, I don't know, for a long time. And I've heard an awful lot of different suppositions on this, and I've finally come to the conclusion that the text very clearly says six days, evening and morning. You, when you read Genesis chapter 1, the intent of the author is six days, okay? Now, to make that six million, six billion, whatever, seems to me that we are starting somewhere else and trying to read in something to the text. We're not taking the text at face value. And what really kind of persuaded me towards a, I hate to use the word literal, six days, but the six days of creation is that when you look at observance and rite and all the rest of it throughout the Bible, the rites or the celebrations that we have are based on historic reality. And I think this dawned on me um, one time when I was reading in, in Genesis when Jacob is wrestling with the angel and the angel touches his hip and, and wins the battle. And then it has this little thing. This is why we don't eat the meat from the hip. And I'm going, because this happened, okay? It's not because meat from the hip is, eh, we don't want to eat that, or whatever, and so we make up a story. It's, we don't eat it because we're remembering Jacob wrestling with the angel. And you think about everything, the Passover, the stones coming up out of the Jordan River when they made that pile because they crossed on dry land, the resurrection. Okay, you think of all of these things. These are historic realities. And as my colleague would say, they're not stories. Okay? Um, they're truth. And our celebration, our remembrance um, of those things 
is based on historic reality. And so if the creation is six days plus a Sabbath, we have our weekly cycle that we celebrate all the time, okay? It's based, it's rooted in history that God created. Now, I can't answer all the questions. Well, how do you measure days when there wasn't a moon and all that stuff? To me, that's like, eh, okay, you're being an idiot. You know, um, just take the text for what it says, okay? That's the intent of the author. Um, and I, I did a little reading, and this is by no way a, a proof of anything, but it's obviously God's design of the week is the seven-day cycle. Um, and you see it when the French Revolution happened and they went to the revolutionary calendar. They wanted to get rid of Christianity. That was their motive. So they went to a 10-day week, and part of it was the obsession with, I probably can't say the word, decimalization. We're, um, this is when uh, the metric system and everything, I think, was introduced um, into Europe through the French, and everything became decimal instead of, like, base 12 with the time clock. I think they even tried to mess with the clock. Um, but it didn't last. Um, it lasted probably, I think it was 1792 to 1805. And when, 18, when Napoleon cut a deal with the Pope in 1805, um, they reverted back to the Gregorian calendar and the seven-day week, okay? You have the same phenomenon happening in so the Soviet Union in the 1920s, I believe it was, they created what they called the Soviet calendar. They, again, wanted to eradicate a religion, so what they did was they got rid of Saturday and Sunday for Judaism and Christianity and had a five-day week. So then they had to have six weeks in the month to get their 30 days. They usually rename all the months, rename the weeks. You know, they, they have to eradicate everything. And again, it didn't last. It, uh, in fact, it lasted until, and I, I misread, so I can't remember if it was 40 or 42, but that's right when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, and the Soviets, to try to drum up patriotism to stay in power, went back to calling Russia Holy Mother Russia. They started giving medals. They started doing all kinds of things which were anti-communist uh, because it started recognizing the individual and different things like that because they wanted to win the war, okay? And so uh, the whole calendar kind of fell out of uh, favor and use. Now, does that prove that God created the world in six days? Well, of course not, okay? But I do find it interesting that this seven-day cycle is part of creation. Uh, in fact, I personally would argue that that's what's behind the sevens in Revelation. And it's interesting that there are six plus one. Uh, there's this gap between number six and seven of trumpets and seals. Um, sounds very much like the Sabbath cycle, the weekly cycle. And so, again, the divines aren't telling us we have to hold to this, that, or the other thing, but it is telling us so this is the way scripture speaks. And then finally, it's very good. And this would be anti-Gnosticism, that the physical world is not evil because it's physical. It is evil because of sin and being under the judgment of God. Um, because of Adam and Eve's sin and our own, we are constantly polluting this uh, world uh, that we live in. Notice that in Christianity, the physical body is extremely valuable. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. Okay? That's our hope, that one day this physical body that is plagued with illness and cancers and all kinds of things that we are plagued with will one day be resurrected from the dead and glorified. Okay? And we will... There, there's got to be a connection here to our identity and our physical body. That there's nothing evil there at all. In fact, it's very good. And so, 
physicality or the world we live in, the things that we touch and smell and taste and all the rest of it, are from the hand of God. And this is how he has created our world. And really, we should rejoice in those things. Okay, let's go to the second part. After God had made all other creatures, he created man, male and female, with reasonable and immortal souls, endued with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness, after his own image. Having the law of God written in their hearts and power to fulfill it, and yet under a possibility of transgressing, being left to the liberty of their own will, which was subject unto change. Beside this law written in their hearts, they received a command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which while they kept, they were happy in their communion with God and had dominion over the creatures. Um, because we're getting short on time, I want to just point out a couple of things, and then what I would encourage you to do if you do reread this on your own is to look for all the benefits that Adam and Eve had. Let's just briefly run down through it here. Um, they had a reasonable and immortal soul. I mean, reasonable is they can think, they're logical, they can, they're rational beings. Endued with knowledge, they're not stupid. Righteous, they're not evil. Um, true holiness, they're really pure, okay? After the image of, of God, okay? Having the law of God written in their hearts, they intrinsically, they know the God's commands and his character. Uh, and the power to fulfill it. Wow, what a beauty, okay? Um, yet, and this is opening the door here for the fall, and yet under a possibility of transgressing, being left to the liberty of their own will, which was subject unto change. Beside this law written in their heart, it's not just enough that they intrinsically know God's commands and his character. They also have an external command. Okay, it's not comprehensive. It's not like the Ten Commandments. But it is a com word from God that's outside of them that says, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which while they kept, they were happy in their communion with God and had dominion over the creatures. This last uh, sentence here is really highlighting the covenant of works, the fact that Adam and Eve are in the garden, and as long as they obey, they are blessed with life, and if they transgress, they will be cursed. Okay, And you have the covenant curses. You have all the elements of a covenant, even though it's not explicitly st stated in Scripture. And the divines don't really specify it at this point in the confession either. However, I do point out that those elements are obviously in their uh, composition here. Let's go back to the beginning of this. Um, again, in our current day, uh, notice that humanity, which would be the word for man here, he created man, meaning mankind, male and female. We are created in a sense, in a pair, that um, it's not good for man to be alone, I'll make him a help meet that we read in chapter two, and that the two, male and female, make up humanity. Each one is created in the image of God, and I think there's a, even a sense in which together they are also in the image of God, okay? Um, there's that whole reflecting God in everything dealing with humanity here. Uh, notice this directly is different than the state of California that thinks there's, I don't know what the latest number is, it was up around 70 the last time I heard, different genders, um, which if you ever took biology, there's X and Y, where are the other letters here? Um, but um, I, I, that's, it, they don't even have to address that, in a sense, because the Bible is, says this is the way it is. It's male and female. Um, 
with reasonable and immortal souls. Um, Sproul has a really good commentary on the Westminster Confession, and uh, on this word immortal, he spends a couple of paragraphs uh, really kind of taking issue with the word. And he uses it as an opportunity to make the point that the confession is not inspired, it's fallible, and we have to be careful that we're not misunderstanding what it's saying, and we always need to go back to scripture. And he has difficulty with the word immortal here for two reasons. One is, um, it, I don't think it directly is how most people would look at the word, but in Greek philosophy, um, they, the Greeks held that the soul of man was eternal and immortal, and that there was, there was some schools of thought that there was like this perpetual reincarnation thing going on, and that in and of themselves, they were almost like little mini-gods. They, they were eternal beings, okay? And Sproul says the, the word immortal just means that we have a beginning, it's just that there is no end, okay? But his second con, uh, objection to the term, and I kind of think, well, what other term are you gonna use here? Um, but his second objection to the term is that the, um, oh, I can't, my, I lost my words here, um, that, that the person themselves are not immortal. We're only immortal, our soul is only immortal by the grace of, by the good pleasure of God. If, if God decided that we wouldn't be immortal anymore, guess what? We're not immortal anymore. It's not that in and of ourselves we possess this soul that's going to go on like the Energizer Bunny forever. Um, that, that, that isn't the way it is. The only reason you and I have an immortal soul is because God is pleased to grant that to us. Okay? Um, and I thought that's a good perspective. I never really looked at it that way. Um, and again, Sproul is trying to draw us back to everything is dependent upon God's good pleasure. Um, and that's uh, one of the points that he makes there. The next line here, knowledge, righteousness, I'm going to have to wrap it up here pretty quick. Um, and true holiness is usually the reformed understanding of what makes up the image of God and what was lost at the fall. Uh, however, I would encourage you to think of the image of God as being really a little bigger than that. Um, personally, I see things like uh, creativity as one of the marks of the image of God. And even though we are fallen, we see terrible pagans who use brilliant creativity okay, for horrible purposes. Okay? But that's part of the image of God is it's a vestige that creativity just as God is creator we are made in his image and we reflect that um, let's see I should probably wrap this up so what I wanted to end with is if we look at the first Adam it points to the need for the second Adam because we know he's going to fail not because he wasn't created perfect, but because he was, in a sense, <laughs> given the option. I don't know quite else how to say it. Obviously, this is God's intent. There's no surprise. It's not like God created the garden and put Adam and Eve in. Oh, no, what has happened? Um, he obviously knew this is planned. This is all part of his purpose. But when we look at the second Adam, we have one who is not in an ideal position. He's hungry, he's in the desert, and yet he lives by the word of God. He obeys from the heart continuously. He sweats drops of blood resisting temptation and is willing to gladly lay down his life for his sheep. And I, and I find the, the contrast is amazing. And, this is where we need to go back to Genesis 2 and see the first Adam in his glory 
But yet, look at how much more glorious the second Adam is. Okay? The second thing is the parallel between creation and redemption. The fact that God speaks the world into existence. We are born, what does Peter tell us? By the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You and I become believers because of God's spoken word. Okay? Just as God created the world out of nothing, he takes sinful people and by his word, he creates regeneration and faith and hope. And I think the parallel, this is why Paul calls us a new creation. The, the, the parallel here, and this is why, from a Christian perspective, any sort of evolutionary view of origins destroys that parallel, okay? You have to have God creating the world six days by divine fiat to really see the parallel to uh, salvation. And uh, I think it's a glorious picture. So let me close. We're out of time. And uh, uh, thank you. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word. Father, we are humbled by your creative activity, who you are, and your purposes. They are beyond our understanding. We confess that you are our creator, our redeemer, and our Lord. We thank you that we can actually call you Abba, Father. We pray that you would bless your word to us. We pray for the service to follow, that you would be glorified, and that we would be edified. We ask that in Jesus' name.